is Pixie, this is Flora and Jill to some level. Um, today we wanted to do a video all about inner worlds. Inner worlds are something that can happen with DID, OSDD, um, or maybe even I've heard about people that don't have DID or OSDD having an inner world. So I just wanted to talk all about the concept of it, some sort of different like community takes, different ways people have beliefs about it, and also the way that ours looks and functions and how we access it and things like that. So this video is going to be all about everything inner worlds. So let's start off with the basics of just what is an inner world. An inner world is a mental visualization of an internal world that you have inside your head. This isn't quite like a dream because it usually happens happens while you're waking. Inner worlds can be really, really crucial to folks with DID and OSDD because it's a place where alters can really communicate in a much more concrete, visualized way than just kind of if everything was swirling around in a nebulous void of black and like purple spots, which sometimes it is, but I feel like that's more of a headspace than an inner world. We're just gonna get all into it. Inner worlds are also an area that don't have as much research done about them. It's kind of something that's hard to gather a ton of data on because it's so internalized and it's so different for each and every person. So my channel is not really one that we like to make super educational, but I'm just gonna try and describe what it is for the sake of you guys understanding me as like a content creator and maybe your friends or people you may come across that are plural or multiple um, if they like that terminology. So yeah, I do just wanna pop a little note here that I'm not 100% certain if this is a DID OSD specific phenomenon or if folks with maybe PTSD or other conditions may have an inner world that just doesn't function for the purpose of having alters communicate, or even if a neurotypical person could have an inner world, or if that would just be kind of maladaptive daydreaming, if the inner world doesn't serve the purpose of sorting and processing trauma, and if it's just used for escapism, there's so much to get into about it. So yeah, I don't want to declare anything as fact here. Again, this is not an educational video per se. In like a scientific clinical way, this is just lived experience, patient to patient. So probably the most important thing to know about inner worlds to understand them um, is to understand their purpose and their function. I touched on that briefly about how the inner world can help be a visualizer for different parts. It can help sort them and it can help you clearly more visually see in your head parts talking to one another, which can make it a lot easier to get that communication going with those different parts in your brain, which is really, really crucial for working together to lead a coherent life. We are just a system of 10 ish that we're aware of and we have like seven ish that usually interact so we all just kind of fit in one house but there are many people in systems that have much much larger even like poly fragmented systems that kind of have like subsects of bubbles of systems within systems so that's another really really important function of the inner world is to compartmentalize and kind of separate different groups that maybe aren't ready or in a healthy enough place to share all of their trauma, all of their information, things that went on here and here maybe they're not ready to know each other, um, and this is the most functional way for the system to be right now. Um, that's not so much a thing in our experience, we aren't, um, we don't have a super super high alter count, we are not polyfragmented. I know there are two alters that are not in the house we have, and I don't know where they are, but I have a vague, I know Cliff knows, and he just said, she's still around, she's still apart, she's just over here. Um, she's still around, she's still apart when you're ready to sort through that trauma and focus on that when we get back into EMDR. Um, it has something to do with school. He'll give me a tiny bit of a flash, tiny bit of a flash of an office building, tiny bit of a flash of a school. So I kind of sort of know that there's someone here and someone there, but I don't have like chambers or layers or galaxies like some systems may have. So yeah, basically communication and compartmentalization, I would say are the two biggest, most important 
functions of the inner world. And that really comes down to the basics of how DID works, sharing information or communicating information, keeping things hidden behind amnesia walls. It's all just visualized in the inner world. And that's why when you talk to many different folks with DID or OSDD, they will have completely different inner worlds, but they will follow similar themes. And that's because the function is still there to keep alters separate, to bring them together. Myself is Flora, I have a cabin that is separate from the house, but it took a while before I actually knew the rest of the system. Um, we had not communicated for a, a long, long, long time. Jarek and I had like never really said hi, um, nor had I with like really anyone else. I'd had a bit of contact with Cliff here and there. Obviously Jill and I are very, very close. We're co right now. But um, for a long, long time, I was in a completely separate building. Um, that was, I'd say maybe a 10 minute walk um, just through the forest and then it fades into the backyard and then just straight to the back door of our inner world home um, where we have pretty much nightly meetings. So that's a little bit of how that compartmentalization works in my inner world or our inner world. But um, it's really not uncommon for inner worlds to have layers where kind of the deeper you go down, um, the less contact uh, the regular kind of group of alters may have with them. It may be deeper, deeper, deeper buried trauma. And like I mentioned, I've also heard of folks having inner worlds with complete different planets where like you know it's there because there's evidence you've seen in journals or messaging or you, you know that exists but it's literally a completely different world to you. I don't know why the British hit my literally there. I turned into Dan Howell. One important and interesting note to probably bring up early on in this video as well. We'll see how early on we are. I guess I've been filming for 16 minutes already. But one very interesting thing is not everyone or not every sister will even have an inner world. It may not form naturally and it's actually something that I've heard many therapists will guide their patient with DID or OSDD to create um, because it can help so much with getting that communication across. It is quite universally understood for the inner world to be a healthy thing for systems to have and to have access to. Our inner world has existed for as long as we can remember. It has changed hugely throughout the years. Our therapist did guide us once in one visualization exercise where we created um, like a vessel sort of like a receptacle is that the right word for storing negative memories and we did this in preparation for getting into EMDR and it was really really useful so there's one just additional thing that was added to our inner world and it really is interesting how you'll do that in one session and it remains there consistently it's just a big white wooden like recycling trash type thing that's in the backyard and we had used that when we would have a really difficult EMDR session and we needed just to pack things away for a moment in order to be safe to travel home and then later at, at a different time we were able to take it back out and look at it so um, yeah just it's just another way to show how it it may sound completely unbelievable and wild that like you're telling me you took your memory wrapped it up in a bag and threw it in the trash in your brain and then it was gone it is really 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 amazing how the brain will visualize for you with images things that happen physically in your brain. On the note of it being a rather helpful and healthy tool for systems to have, um, I want to touch on the comparison of an inner world to maladaptive daydreaming or just daydreaming in general. I know that word maladaptive can sound quite harsh. Like I've said, it's a very healthy thing for systems to have. Um, I just use the word maladaptive daydreaming because that is the word that's been given to the phenomenon of um, people that kind of will I guess make make time in their day to mentally shut off and kind of meditate into a fantasy world for escapism um, and how this is very very different than using an inner world to facilitate communication. When I go into my inner world it's often not fun. It's not an escapism. Sometimes, sometimes it can be really lovely and wonderful. Like we decorated a tree around Christmas. We've gone on the odd car ride together in a world at sunset, like a couple nice things, but it's really often just business, just chatting, 
there can be conflict in a world that can be extremely distressing. But that conflict is obviously important if a part of you is hurting, someone needs to hear that out. It needs to be addressed, it needs to be helped. There have been times where I've been laying there and there are things going on in our inner world and my, my body physically is just, I'm getting the rushes of cortisol, the trembling, the sweating, the nausea, my stomach will drop, I will be shaking, I will have a full panic attack laying there. Um, and it's not like I can't get up, I'm not in paralysis or anything, but I know at this point that processing those things, even if it's conflict, even if it's a really, really difficult conversation internally, it is at the end of the day really, really important to hear out your parts and your alters when they are directly reaching out to you, especially if they're they're crying for help. So yeah, I guess I just, just want to give a couple of kind of differences between accessing your inner world um, and like maladaptive daydreaming, um, or again just daydreaming in general. The main thing being that being in the inner world is not always a fun, fantastical escape experience. Most nights it's kind of like I'm having like a daily meeting. <laughs> it reminds me of like student council, honestly. Just checking in, getting the notes can be nerve wracking. There are parts that not, there are parts that don't get along as well or don't know each other as well or that I'm just, I'm, we're uncomfortable right now. It's more, it's, it's more akin to going into like, yeah, a classroom or something and knowing, okay, I have to have this meeting. There's, there's friends here I love. There's people that I'm not as close with. There's that one girl that hates me. That's not in a world. No one, I don't think anyone in our brain hates each other, but yeah, it's, it's less of a, I'm going to go close my eyes and, and dream about Hogwarts or, or shifting or something, this is very much not um, escaping to an alternate reality. It's a visualization um, that just helps you function uh, multiply. Another big thing that made it clear to me that it wasn't daydreaming, because especially early on in system discovery, um, you can wonder like, am I just crazy? Am I just making this all up? Um, but one thing I think Gianu System said, especially um, in one video of theirs, I bet I could never find it again, but Gianu System mentioned that um, their, their other alters in their inner world will do things that shock and surprise them. They will say things that maybe they didn't know, that one part will say something another part didn't know. They will do things that shock and surprise. Um, so it's definitely not that I am concocting with marionettes a scenario in my head to entertain myself. I only have control over me internally, and I have no idea what any other alters experiences in our world. Um, maybe if, if anyone else in our system wants at some point, I would love to know because I genuinely have no idea what, like, Jarek's experience is in the inner world. Um, I only know, like, mine. Jill's and Flora's right now. It's strange, but I have access to kind of both sides. I think those are my main points on the differences between choosing to daydream on purpose for escapism and accessing your inner world almost as a like duty. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I also want it to be very clear that this is not like shifting to another, yeah, reality or that I think that this is a physical place in another realm uh, or yeah, a simulation thing, like this is the real world. I definitely don't think any of that. I just think this is a visualization that my brain does to help the multiple parts of my brain communicate. Another really, really interesting point I wanted to bring up in relation to inner worlds is the whole, how clear do you see the apple? How clear is your inner image. It is really, really shocking to me. This is one thing that you really don't know is different until you kind of ask everyone else in the world about it, but some people don't have an internal monologue. Some people do not see, they can't visualize. Um, I have extremely, extremely, extremely clear visualization in my head. It almost feels more real than real life sometimes. Um, and I also have a very, very overwhelmingly loud internal dialogue of multiple parts. So I wonder if the experience of the, the vividness of an inner world would be different, or even if, if someone had DID, but they also had aphantasia, I think is the word for when you can't visualize. I wonder if they would 
have an inner world, or if it would be difficult for them to make one, and if that would change anything about how their system functions. I just thought that was really interesting to bring up. Again, please let me know down below if you guys, you know, where you are on the visualization scale. How clear is the apple from one to five? As well as, do you have an internal monologue or dialogue? Do you say I? Do you say we? Do you speak in the third person and use your name? And are you a singlet or are you multiple? I think all of this stuff is so, so, so interesting, not just, you you know, DID and inner worlds, but the whole human experience from completely neurotypical to neurodivergent, like all with the works. I just think that's so, 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 so fascinating. So yeah, my inner world is, is very vibrant because my inner visualization has always been very, very vibrant. Um, and my voices are very, very loud because my internal monologue dialogue has just always been so loud. The last general point I want to touch on before I go into my inner world and also bring up a bunch of people on Twitter who I asked about what their inner world is like, um, the last little point is inner worlds changing over the years. I didn't know that this was a shared experience until I asked folks on Twitter, so this is really, really interesting, but our inner world has completely changed um, over the course of our life. It shifted from like a grassy forest, and then in middle school it shifted to this post-apocalyptic desert, um, like futuristic, which was absolutely completely just sucked out from the Danger Days world from My Chemical Romance and like Gerard Way's comic. It may just be a lack of creativity, not that I think I'm lacking in it, but it was just easy and safe and comfortable. Once our system started becoming aware of itself, um, the inner world looked a lot, a lot, a lot different, um, and we have I feel dizzy, like I'm gonna throw up. What's I talking about? <sighs> What's I talking about? I hate when the DID DIDs. What just happened? Oh, cute. The side is cute. I really do have like a little talk show. What are we gonna talk about? Inner world changing. Oh, yes, when our system became aware of itself. I don't. Oh, okay. What's going on? We were in the middle of filming. Oh, I talked about system discovery. Yeah, guess what? You know what you need to remember is that talking about DID can make you switch. Cause it's like, especially when you're talking about your whole history and everything that's ever happened. I don't know when I stopped talking, but I think it's Jill and Jer now. I don't know what happened. But yeah, our current inner world is definitely subconsciously super duper based on our childhood home and childhood hometown. All of our alters live in a house. It's very common for people to have a house or a mansion or a castle or an office building. We have a house. It looks kind of similar to our childhood house. The big, big blue house, bear in the big blue house. I wonder if that was subconsciously, like, on purpose, if you know what I mean. Our childhood house is not blue. That was cute. It's got a tiny little stained glass door. It's got a really, really, like, big backyard. I spend a lot of time internally in the backyard, just kind of decompressing, like, in the grass. It's really valuable to kind of, like, meditate and release and, like, do deep breathing and calm your body in that way while you're kind of mentally chilling in your backyard. The house is three levels and we all have different rooms. Veronica has the whole basement. Don't ask why. When Jax split, her room just appeared, which was really interesting. It did make mine slightly smaller, but hers is kind of like a long wedge. Jer's is across from mine. Barry's room is very, very precious. Her 
locker room is also very vivid. I think that's really important for our main little to have like a safe internal space. Cliff space is upstairs. There's a big staircase in the middle of the living room that heads upstairs and it's always really, really sunny. There's like floor to ceiling windows. Again, it's like, you don't have to buy things in the in a world. You can just have floor to ceiling windows all you like in a beautiful little garden. Every night when I check in, we usually spawn on like the couch or when I check in, usually Cliff's on the couch in the living room, just hanging out, pretty much waiting for me. Um, Jer can be in his room or in the living room. Veronica's usually downstairs. Sometimes Flora is in the living room with us. Sometimes she's at our cabin. I don't know what I guess it would just be if she's closer to us or not mentally, if she's like front or not. That must be what decides who's in the living room when I enter would be who's closest to front. That's interesting to think about. One thing about us specifically, I don't want to say this as an overarching statement, but we cannot just access our inner world kind of loosey-goosey throughout the day. Um, that more so is a headspace which I consider a kind of separate thing. I can't just close, you know, when I'm hanging out at the mall and I hear Jer make a comment about something, I don't see him sitting on a couch, like, with a Red Bull. It's more kind of nebulous void time, just hearing a voice. I have heard other systems say that the inner world is where alters go when they're not fronting. I think that's interesting. That's not how I experience it. That's I'm not going to say that that's not how it works, but that is not how I experience it. I think when my alters aren't fronting, you know, they're still in there. They're still in my brain. But it's, it's not like whenever I touch base at the end of the day, he doesn't have hours of memory of like working at Hot Topic. Oh yeah, he said mention the Hot Topic. There, there are other buildings in our inner world that all exist for different functions. There is a mall. We do dream, you know, like sleeping dream about the inner world mall a lot. I think those are mostly like Barry influenced dreams. Barry is our four to six year old because that Toys R Us is laid out the exact same way every time. The same little stands, the same aisles, the same things on the shelves, same with like the there's like a Hot Topic, there's a liquor store where the, my wine that I get is on the same spot every time. The Hot Topic has the same layout every time, but the items will change out. I thought that was really funky. If you guys have inner worlds, let me know if you have stores that are always laid out the same like to, to the items on the shelves. Like, I know where my chips are and I'll get them in my dream. And also, do you dream of your inner world? Because I think that's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure if it would be possible for the brain to hold that many like bundles of information of like 10 people's things happening throughout the day i'm pretty sure you can can i feel like i don't know i feel like you only process if i was also subconsciously processing jarek bringing someone through at a hot topic like irl as i like make my coffee I think that would be very, very, very stressful. But it's more so just kind of a symbolic, kind of kind of purpose-fulfilling thing. Like, Jarek missed out on a lot of our teen years and a lot of our high school years, especially, um, when it was more me and Flora fronting and being more like hee 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 bubbly. And then it felt like any time Jarek was out kind of just ended up being outbursts or like really struggling with borderline stuff. And then it just kind of, he just felt like you know, uh, uh, an exiled little demon. We don't, we don't need to get into that right now. So it may sound silly like, oh, your emo alter works at a hot topic in your brain. Like it sounds very, very on the nose on the surface, but I worked at Claire's Accessories looking like this in high school. And there's this other part of me that has very strong, you know, similar fashion opinions, but about a completely different style that didn't get to experience those really like core growing teen memories of working retail. So it's just kind of something that happens as like a symbol of healing thing. But personally for me, um, I don't really resonate with the inner world is where alters go when they're not fronting big, just for me. Sorry if this video is kind of all over the place. It's really hard because I'll start on one bit and then I get kind of like a post-it note about something else. I really don't know who I am right now. I feel like we keep going bleep boop blap boop bleep boop blap boop bleep boop blap boop boop. 
I think it's just safe to say it's like Jill, Flora, Jer, Soup Combo. But yeah, I guess that's kind of a, a smaller representation of that compartmentalization of, of keeping different parts in different places for different purposes, um, where I have a couple of different buildings in my internal world internal world. I never called it that. But yeah, there's our house, there's Flora's cabin, there's the mall. I know Flora's around because we just did that when I was like, cabin. <laughs> there's a neighborhood where I don't think the houses are exactly the same, but the main roads are the same. Sometimes it'll scramble a little bit. There is a big stadium empty gym type thing that we used to go to to try and like prepare and ready ourselves for EMDR internally. We would kind of try and gather as many altars as we could, sit them in two rows of chairs. Um, we did that so that as many altars as possible could get the benefits from EMDR. Um, obviously we wouldn't let like a little see a really really traumatizing memory they weren't ready to see, but it, it was really valuable and, and really helpful for my parts to mentally drive to this building, go in, sit in rows, and look at a stage which had my therapist and I on it doing EMDR. Um, that actually helped to share those memories with all those parts because the visualization is, you know, we're driving to the empty gym, but what is really happening is just that you're gathering all those parts to front so that they can observe and process what's going on. We also have a building in our world that I haven't been to in a long time, but I have an internalized like dream version of my future fashion store. It's a little five petal flower. This formed when I was in fashion school and when I was really, really, really focusing gung-ho on all of that. And then when I graduated, it really kind of had to take a back seat because I had so much internal work to do to get to a level where I could function enough to ever dream of running a business. So I haven't been there in a little while, but I think it will come back um, in hopefully soon coming months to year, question mark, S in brackets, when I knuckle down on selling fashion and stuff like that. But it's beautiful. It has a downstairs. It has checkered floor. It's kind of like not an oblong building. Is that what it's called? It's almost like a triangle building on the corner. And it's on like the beachfront. That's probably because we grew up in PEI. It's on like a waterfront with a boardwalk. Of course it's pink. Actually, isn't it pastel yellow on one side? And then upstairs there's a staff room with windows that overlook the ocean again. In the inner world, you don't need to rent spaces or pay for being on the waterfront. It's very fancy. But it would suck if my inner world dream fashion store was like... <laughs> like in a terrible corner. A, ca a terrible dusty corner. That would be sad. I'm trying to remember if there's any other spaces. Again, I know there is an office building somewhere that holds another part that we just don't need right now, but she's waiting. She's, <laughs> she's waiting. She's waiting. And I know that there is a school somewhere um, with another part. I don't know much more about them. I know Cliff does. I wouldn't be so certain about if those altars even existed still or if they had gone fully dormant or if they had fused. I wouldn't be so sure if I didn't have Cliff to talk to. Cliff seems to know a bit more about the inner world. I should have asked him about this video. <laughs> Maybe he'll add something later. So yeah, different spaces in your inner world can hold different things can serve different functions. I am going to go on to read some testimonials from Twitter. Is that the right word? Because an inner world is such a unique personal experience for each individual with DID or OSDD. I really wanted to ask different people's takes on this because I am just one brain and I'm actually, again, quite new into being aware of the fact that we have this disorder. So I was like, this, this, you know, this would be goofy for me to just do this all alone. So thank you guys for everyone one who I was gonna say mailed in. Thank you to all the callers who called in to my radio show. I'll start off with some quick rapid fire ones just to show you guys how varied the experience can be. As host, I can only access it in dreams. They're distinctly different from ordinary dreams. One of our oldest altars is the dream architecture slash space. Someone else replied, I'm a host that can barely access mine too. Even when I leave front, I can't go in unless I'm really not doing well. Someone says mine switches. In a comfy space, we are in a collective with multiple bedrooms with shared living space where we share info, cooperate, and plan ahead. 
They hide stuff in their rooms or retreat when worn. Outside our comfort space, it's a car. They like to hold slash take the wheel. Ours changes depending on how well communication is going slash who's fronting slash level of integration. For the host, it's like an empty dark room with a desk. For others, deeper in the system, it's a more complex eldritch mansion with multiple floors, closets, tunnels, etc. Let me know if you want more. Someone says our inner world is our childhood home but with an elaborate basement and secret passages behind mirrors. Sometimes it's just so on the nose, eh? You're like, oh, ah, thank you, brain. Someone says, I don't have one. Not a single altar could tell you about it at all. Tried working on one with a therapist, but no luck. That is really, really interesting. I guess that that adds to my point earlier. I won't say proves my point, but it adds to the point earlier where I said, I wonder if you don't have, I should ask them if they have aphantasia. Ours looks like this. Every head made of ours has their own room slash space that they go to. I access it by just kind of thinking since we've gotten really good at inner communication. We front by taking a piece of the fronting orb. The fronting orb. I love hearing how other people visualize it. That is orb. I'm trying not to say like that's cool or like that's fascinating. So I'm just trying to use the <laughs> neutral language because like it, it exists to keep you safe from like trauma. So I don't want to be like cool orb, but like the fronting orb. Our inner world is a cabin. Each altar has their own room and there's some common areas. The rooms are very much our spaces and we don't usually go in each other's rooms. Same with us. I end up accessing it when I'm trying to coordinate with other parts or to talk, but not every switch. Yeah, yeah, we never, never go in our world for... Well, I guess sometimes we do, actually. I don't really think about that. If we're, yeah, dissociated to the point where we are, like, not in touch with reality, i.e. going through a switch or something, sometimes I will actually see in our world someone being like, get on the couch, or I'll see, like, a hand reaching out. But it's not as vivid as when I intentionally, um, like, lay down and ground into it. So yeah, I guess I do see it sometimes throughout the day, but only during, like, a very, very dissociated switch. Ours is a forest clearing with three houses, one for each of us, that all look very different. One has a giant garden of flowers, one has a garage with multiple broken cars and scrap, Mine has herbs and dark purple accents. As host, I can't really see the others in detail. A lot of people saying that themselves as the host, they can't see their inner world very vividly. That's really interesting. Our inner world is a version of a physical place we're familiar with. In real life, it's a giant market with alternative fashion and vintage shops and cafes and things, but in our head, we've each claimed rooms we like and decorated it together. This is a really great one I think I'm gonna end off on. Personally for me, the inner world functions both as a way for me to better understand how my DID works and a metaphorical sense and as a safe space for all of us. Because my inner world is a manor, hence my username, oh, Lemons Manor, I used to call the phrases I'd use to describe internal experiences as manor metaphors. So like, in the courtyard meant present but not fronting. Nose against the gate meant very close to the front slash practically co-fronting, etc. Unless I'm pretty dissociated already, I have to meditate to fully visualize it, me too. For me, even though it's a safe space, I think it's important to note that it's still metaphorical and not literal, even though it can feel that way because that's where we experience internal happenings. It's still an important place, it's just an important place that's personal to my thoughts. Sorry for the long ass reply, no. Don't apologize, that is perfect, that is pretty much exactly how I feel. You really worded it better than I think I even could. I hope you guys like this video, um, I hope I explain things in a way that makes sense, and I hope I hope I didn't step on any toes. I hope I just described like the facts that mostly everyone can agree on. I know that there's the way that it physically functions, there's the way everyone experiences it differently, and then there's kind of the beliefs some people might have about it. I'm gonna do the features in the next video because this one is long and personal and I'm getting so, I'm very dissociate and I'm struggling to even like read words or speak a full sentence so I'm gonna cut this off. I love you guys so much. I keep doing this heart. That's so satisfying. Hello. I love you guys so much. I'll see you in the next video which is not this one because this one's over. Bye.